It's joined now by Albert Breer of Sports Illustrated. He's been doing a good job covering all of the drama of the NFL. And I want to start here because I just opened the show talking about it, Albert. How many teams do you think more would have bid on Brady if they knew what he was going to look like on the field this year? I don't mean if he knew he was going to win the Super Bowl, obviously. But I mean just throwing 40 touchdown passes, continuing to get better and better as the season went along. How many teams, because it didn't seem like Brady had a massive market. I think we talked about the Bucks and maybe the Chargers being somewhat interested in uh, in him, maybe the Titans a little bit. But how many more teams would have bid on Brady if they knew he was capable of throwing 40 or 50 touchdowns and would look like he did? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, mean, I think Clay, is, his market would obviously be complicated by his age. And so there are certain teams where it should be a non-starter based on the fact that um, you know, maybe they aren't ready to win at that level yet. But I, I think there are a couple that you can point to and say maybe they would have been better off. Um, the Niners are one. Now Jimmy got hurt. But I think based on his history, you could have forecast that there was injury risk with Jimmy to begin with. So there's one. And he wanted to go to San Francisco. Um, you know, the Titans, I think it's a fair question, although Ryan Tannehill has played at a pretty high level there. Um, the Colts, I think you can certainly say maybe they would have been better off with Brady over Rivers based on where their roster is. And the one sort of like curveball one to me that makes sense would be New Orleans. And I just look at the composition of that roster and the issues that they're going to have now going forward with the salary cap, some of their free agents. They were really in a sweet spot this year where um, they were, I think, at a championship level at so many different positions. And so the, the Saints would be the one where you look at them and say, I, you understand why they couldn't walk away from Drew Brees, but you, you, you look at the situation they were in and the sort of year that Brees had, the ups and downs and everything else. And um, I think you can certainly say, like the Saints, maybe they would have been the box if Tom Brady had been their quarterback. It's it's interesting um, as you as you kind of break this down in a larger context. Much of the drama in the off season is almost exclusively going to be centered around the quarterback position. I saw a lot of the mock mm-hmm. drafts. I think Todd McShay's mock draft went up yesterday or day before, whatever it was, and I think he had five quarterbacks going in the top twelve, which is uh, which is pretty crazy, including the first four all being quarterbacks um, of the quarterbacks that are out there. How many guys do you think are actually available in this mix right now? Okay, These are the guys that have created the most drama of late. Russell Wilson, Dak Prescott, Carson Wentz, Deshaun Watson. It seems to me that Carson Wentz is the only one on that list that maybe is 100% available for the taking. Would you expect that Russell Wilson, Dak Prescott, or Deshaun Watson are available at all? Are teams even willing to listen to offers for them? No, I mean, I think right now Carson Wentz is the only one who's available, and he's very available um, because the Eagles shot for the moon and asking for the Matthew Stafford return. I I don't even know if they're going to be able to get a one back, which was sort of supposed to be their baseline. Um, But by making this negotiable night, by making it public, I think they've sort of reached the point of no return with Carson Wentz. So I think he'll be dealt just a matter of where and for what. Um, With the other three guys, I mean, look, like Dak's medical kind of, complicates things a little bit i i do believe that they're going to wind up tagging him and he's going to be their quarterback in 2021 um the uh the the the, the, the contract negotiation i think is going to be interesting because there's so much water under the bridge there um, and then i think with deshaun and with with russell wilson both teams fully intend to hold on to the guys um these are different things though i mean deshaun watson's put up with a lot um and he's been a good soldier through a lot in houston and I think he's sort of at the point where he's fed up. Um, and where this goes, I think, is going to be interesting just because Houston hasn't um, even entertained trade offers. Um, teams have called, and they've said he's just not available. And you know, at the same time, when they've tried to get in touch with Deshaun, he's not returning their calls. So it's hard to say where that one's going to go, but it's kind of built to this work. With Russell Wilson, some of the stuff you're hearing now, I think has sort of been – I, I, I would say like years long, like low level displeasure with certain things that in that organization. And I, it feels to me a little like Russell seized upon some of the things that we've seen happen with Aaron Rodgers um, and with Matthew Stafford over the last few weeks. So this is uh, I want to go to the Russell Wilson situation. 
it seems to me, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, that Pete Carroll has been in Russell Wilson's corner about as aggressively as a head coach can be in the corner, even to the extent that when there seemed to be an offenses, offense versus defense battle that was emerging, he shipped and moved on from Richard Sherman, uh, from Michael Bennett, from all those guys that were a big part of the defense. Uh, the Legion of Boom, I think, was their nickname back when they beat uh, the Denver Broncos and said, no, 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 Uh, when Russell Wilson threw that interception, Russell Mm -hmm. Wilson is the future of this franchise. We're going to move on from anybody who doesn't believe that. And there may have been some apprehension or disagreement on that defensive side of the ball. It surprised me that Russell Wilson was willing to say anything negative like he did publicly. Did it surprise you? Would you agree with that characterization about Pete Carroll being in Russell Wilson's camp? I'd agree with you, like that he has defended Russell Wilson and he's been in Russell Wilson's corner. Um, to the point where, you know, I, like Pete's been pretty, I guess, uh, consistent about the way he wants his teams built and the way he wants his offense run. And he veered from that last year to try to accommodate Russell Wilson. So he's made accommodations for him, um, you know, over time. I, I think as much as anything else, again, I just feel like this is sort of Russell seizing on something that he's be- seeing happen and other places across the league, his complaint about getting hit too much, like, is not new. Like, that goes back to before they even dealt for Dwayne Brown to be their left tackle a few years ago. And, um, you know, so I, I sort of think that this is like a continuation of what we saw with Aaron Rodgers, where I don't necessarily think that it's, I want to get out of town. It's, I see that now I've got an avenue to put pressure on my front office to go and get me help. And I think what those guys are looking at they look at Buffalo going and getting Stephon Diggs for Josh Allen. They look at how aggressive the Chiefs have been in putting weapons around Patrick Mahomes. They look at what Tampa's done. I mean, the most incredible stat from the Super Bowl, Clay, I thought, all four of the touchdowns were scored by guys who were acquired after Tom Brady, who went to Tampa to be with Tom Brady. Score net, it was Gronkowski um, scoring twice, and then it was Antonio Brown. And so I think as much as anything else, what we've, what we've seen from Wilson is a little bit more like what we've seen from Rodgers, which is I don't necessarily want out right now, but I'm not afraid anymore to put pressure on you to go find me help and be aggressive in doing it because I see other teams doing that for their quarterbacks. It's interesting. Um, you don't think Deshaun Watson's going to move on. Carson Wentz is available. Russell Wilson, maybe a little bit of drama, but it's hard to see anything happening there. What are the Cowboys going to do with Dak? What are you hearing about that? We talked about earlier in the week, Dak follows the Washington football team on uh, his social media, I guess his Instagram account for a short period of time. <laughs> Cowboys leave him out of the hype video, which, I mean, is pretty crazy in and of itself. Uh, what is the story with the Cowboys and Dak, and how does this situation resolve itself? And also, what are you hearing about his health? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the health is worth monitoring. Obviously, the fact that he had a second surgery isn't a great development, um, no matter how you slice it. And we've seen that before with guys having, you know, certain complications with their surgery. So the fact that he had a second surgery isn't great news. Um, you know, and, and I think if you're the team, it might push you into a spot where you'd say, maybe we're better off just tagging him and Again. waiting and seeing for another yeah. year, which I think they will tag him. The problem with that, Clay, is what's on the other side of this. His franchise tag number for 2022 would be over $52 million, which is just, I mean, that's like a quarter of your salary cap. You know what I mean? Like, so, like, I think at that point, it's, you know, Dak can look at it and say, well, all right, tag me again. I'll collect my $40 million. You either give me a deal I'm happy with, or I've got $52 million or free agency coming to me in 2022. So one way or the other, I'm either going to have $92 million over the next two years, or I'm going to wind up being a free agent at 28 years old. So, you know, I think that's why it's difficult to get Dak to agree to a long-term deal, because really his options are, again, either one, $90 million over the next two years, two, close to $40 million in free agency next year, or three, I do a long-term deal. So your long-term deal is going to have to beat out those other two options, which look pretty good. So it it is interesting the Cowboys have found themselves in this spot. Now, you will know the answer better than me. Kirk Cousins is the guy that I remember getting double franchised and then he became a free agent. Is there no prohibition on how many times in a row you can franchise tag a player now in the NFL? It's three times in a row. And so the way it works is the first tag is whatever the assigned number is for your position or 120% of what you made the year before. Um, And then, you know, whatever your figure is in that year – 
The next year is 120% of that, which is where we're at right now, which is going to be about almost $38 million for DAC this year. And then the third tag, which is the final tag, you can't tag a guy past that, is 144% of that number. So that's how you get to over $52 million in 2022. And yeah, three tags and that's it. After that, you can't tag a guy anymore. So right now, DAC is looking at, like, you either, I mean, if we don't do a deal, you either tag me at over $50 million, and then I become a free agent at 29, or I become a free agent at 28. Um, so that is a good position to be in, then, if you're Dak, right? <laughs> yeah. Because you're, I mean, that unless, was a Kirk Cousins position, yeah. Yeah, unless you get uh, another season-ending injury, right? That's the thing that's kind right. of hanging out there. But even if that were to happen – you would still have locked in whatever it is, $75 million, right. basically, right, for two years, and then but, you'd be able to go back to the, to the free agent market. Well, uh, no, yeah, it'd be more than that, Clay, because it's, 30, it's 30, about 38 plus 52, so we're talking about like right around $90 million for the next two years. Right, right. And we're talking about I, last, last year he got Oh, yeah, 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 last year plus this year, yep, yep. And then, so that, and that's then, still not a bad spot to be in, right? I mean, he, no. I mean even worst-case scenario, unless he had like an Alex Smith-level injury or he couldn't come back right. and play well, and he looked like a totally different player, um, he's still going to make a, <laughs> uh, an absolute bevy of money. And consider this, too. I mean, I think, like, the injury thing, it definitely applies at other positions. But doesn't it apply a little less at the quarterback position? I mean, consider, consider this. Tua Tungabaloa suffered a, like, god-awful injury, right? Like yeah. a car accident injury and still went fifth overall in the draft. If that happens to somebody in another position, there is no way the guy, like, goes even in the first round, no matter how good he is. Right. And because Tua is a quarterback, he survived that. We've seen other teams take chances on quarterbacks who are hurt. Dante Culpepper all those years ago coming off the injury he was coming off of. Drew Brees couldn't throw. Like uh, Peyton Manning, you know, the neck injuries. I mean, like, yeah, there's injury risk, but, I, you know, you look at the history of it, and, like, quarterbacks are almost immune to even that. You know what I mean? Like, so, like, the injury risk is there, yes, but for someone like Dak, like, you play that position – and even the injury risk isn't what it is at other positions. So, you know, Dak's in a really good spot. Of course, like, there's the whole human aspect of this, which is when you go through something like what Dak's gone through over the last four months, like, that's, you know, there's going to be maybe a feeling like maybe I should just take my money now. But, yeah, I mean, if you look at the history of it, there's no question. Like, quarterbacks are immune to those sorts of things to some extent. Um, and that's, you know, I, I mean, that was proven out last April was where Tua went in the draft after his injury. Yeah, it's a good point about the difference in the overall quarterback marketplace in general. When you look at, I think I kind of hinted at the idea that five guys might go in the top 12 uh, of the NFL draft, five quarterbacks, uh, that is. How are teams going to make a decision? Like, let's talk about a couple that are out there that are clearly in the market. If you are the Patriots or you are the Bears or you are the Colts, for instance, three teams that I think it's fair to say need quarterbacks. How do you assess potentially being able to make a move in the free agent market, whether it's go aggressively after Carson Wentz, maybe kick the tires on some of these guys, Jameis Winston, Teddy Bridgewater. There's going to be moving parts, right, associated with uh, not only the draft. How do you decide between young guy versus reclamation project, between going and trying to find your version of Ryan Tannehill uh, as opposed to going into the draft and just saying, hey, let's start anew? Yeah, I mean, I think it sort of comes down to like what you're willing to invest in. And, and the fact is, if you take like a chance and say like a Marcus Mariota who's available right now, right? Um, you know, there's a chance it doesn't work. Like, you, there's a chance you go through the same injury issue that the Tennessee went through for all those years. Uh, but the upside is that you don't really have to commit to him long term. So if it doesn't work out, well, you know, then like you can try again next year. You can try again the year after that. Versus. Like, if you make a massive move up, and if you're New England or Indianapolis or Washington, one of these teams that would have to move up to get one of the top four, well, then you're, if you're doing that, then you're probably, you're talking about, all right, this is our quarterback for the next five years. We're not looking for one after this. We can't hit the reset button really after that. Um, we're making a massive investment. And so, you know, I, I think really, you know, when you consider one versus the other, it's, are we kind of stop gapping the position and just buying ourselves time to find a long-term answer? Or do we think there's a long-term answer out there for us? And that to me is kind of, you know, the difference if you're looking at, again, like a Mariota or bringing in a Bridgewater 
versus going and selling out to maybe trade up for a Justin Fields or a Zach Wilson or a Trey Lance. And, um, you know, there are a ton of teams that have used the whole buying time idea in the past to great effect. I think that's what Alex Smith was in Kansas City. Like, the, the Chiefs didn't have to force it for four years because they had perfectly competent quarterback play, and that bought them time to go and find Patrick Mahomes, you know? Um, so we've seen examples of this in the past, and I, I, I do think that that's sort of, you know, what some of these teams are looking at right now, where it's, you know, do I want to find a guy who can be good enough and can buy me time to find a superstar down the line, or do I believe one of the rookies are worth selling out for to go up and get and, and be my superstar for the next for the next 10, 15 years. So what does that mean the Colts do in particular, right? They tried to go find yeah. the bridge gap with Phillip Rivers, and Phillip Rivers is retiring. Jacoby Brissett's a free agent. Doesn't seem likely they're going to commit to him. The Andrew Luck rumors were out there. It doesn't seem like Andrew Luck is going to come back. What do you think they're thinking right now? Is it Carson Wentz or bust? They're I taking mean, tires on Carson Wentz, but I don't know that they're willing. I mean, I can tell you this. They didn't offer a first-round pick for Matthew Stafford. So they were in the Stafford sweepstakes, but they weren't They weren't going to go anywhere close to where the Panthers or Washington or certainly the Rams went on Stafford. So um, I, I think they're certainly in a, in a similar sort of mode with Carson Wentz where it's, we're willing to go there, we're willing to bring him in, but we'd more like to take a flyer on him than we want to truly invest in him. And I think that's where Chicago sort of is right now, too. So um, could the Eagles get a first-round pick for him? Maybe, but I think it would be in a more complicated deal with some other stuff going the other way. Um, so I think that's where the Colts are right now on Carson Wentz. And I think they're very much looking at the idea of trading up, and I think it's a interesting detail, at least, um, Clay, that Chris Ballard, the GM there, was in Kansas City um, for the process of scouting Mahomes, was in Kansas City for the four years that Alex Smith was the quarterback there as they built and built and built the roster up for whoever the long-term quarterback was going to be. And he was one of the guys that kind of, you know, signed off on saying this is Pat- Patrick Mahomes can be the guy here. And so, you know, you sort of wonder, maybe he has somebody in mind this year where they built the roster up. And because of that, maybe they look at some of their draft capital as a little more disposable where they could make a massive move up for a quarterback. So it wouldn't surprise me if we get to April and if Carson Wentz weren't to wind up there, if the Colts or a team were talking about making a massive move up the board for a Fields, a Wilson, or a Lance. Last question for you. How much interest is there in Marcus Mariota? I think it's tepid interest right now. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if he was the, he was the guy that New England wound up going with, to be honest with you. I just I, – I, I think right now the question is, and you watched him for a long time in Nashville, play, I, like, you know, you have to play him a certain way to win with him, and the question is, can he stay healthy if you're playing that way? 